Welcome on behalf of Chef Network and Musgrave Marketplace to um, our webinar this afternoon. My name is Ruth Hegarty and I am delighted to, to host this uh, webinar on Taking On Takeaway where we are going to explore some of the takeaway cook at home and retail models that have been pioneered by restaurants over the past two months since the COVID-19 crisis struck. Um, this is our first time doing a webinar, so hopefully everything will run smoothly. Thank you for your patience um, while we all figure out what we're, we're doing. Um, we're all over the country um, and I, I'm in Galway and um, there is a little bit of a lag with my camera, unfortunately. I think the rest of the participants have better connections than I do. Um, so you shouldn't have any issues seeing and hearing from them. Um, and you won't be seeing too much of me when, once they start talking. Um, so the, the running time for our webinar today is an hour. We're going to hear from four businesses who've rolled out different models. Um, and we'll discuss also some of the practical considerations for doing takeaway. Um, we will have a short Q&A session for about 15 minutes at, um, for about the last 15 minutes. You can enter your questions in the Q&A panel that you'll see on the right hand side of your, your screen. Um, just to let you know that when you send a question, you won't see it published immediately, so don't resubmit it. It will appear um, eventually once it gets published by, by the moderator, assuming it's not um, a duplicate of a question that we've already received. Um, you will see that there's a thumbs up beside the questions. If you see the question that you want answered, please um, just upvote it by giving it a thumbs up rather than resubmitting the same question. And that will allow us just to select the most uh, voted for questions at the end because we'll only have time for a few. Um, so also just to let you know, we are recording the session. Um, so anyone who has pre-registered with us will get um, a link to the recording afterwards. Um, so if you do have connectivity issues or you get cut off, um, you know that the recording will come through to you afterwards. Um, so we've had a huge response to the webinar. Um, we know that this has been a really, really tough time for the industry and there's really tough times ahead. We wanted to do something that would be of some practical value. So we hope this will be useful to people. We're really grateful to the businesses who are taking part for sharing their experiences with the rest of the industry. I know there's going to be lots of little nuggets of wisdom that everyone will be able to take away and hopefully adapt um, to put them into use themselves as they look at taking on uh, takeaway models and new models for their, their industry. Um, unfortunately, the reality is that we're going to see some casualties from this crisis, but we all know that this industry is highly resourceful, highly resilient, and I know that we're also going to see lots of innovation and creativity, and hopefully today's discussion can help inspire some of that. Um, so I'm going to introduce the, the panel. You won't see them um, all straight away, but I'll let you know who we have on, on the line. Um, we're joined from Barna in Galway by Fergus O'Holloran, who's the Managing Director of the 12 Hotel. Um, then we're going to rural County Sligo, where we're jo joined by Johnny Conlon, who is the co-proprietor of Pudding Row. Um, then we're going to go over to Dublin to talk to Grania O'Keefe, who is the culinary director in Bujo and also head chef in Clumbrazil House, although today we'll be focusing on talking to her about Bujo. And we're going to talk to Kevin Arundel, who is the chef proprietor of the Chop House in Dublin. And then we're going to speak also with Clement Pavi, who is the um, head development chef for Musgrave Marketplace and he's been working with lots of their clients who've been looking at um, taking on takeaway and doing new kind of models of doing business. Um, so we're going to go first to Fergus O'Holloran in the 12 Hotel um, and Fergus I know that you guys really were quite quick off the blocks in terms of decide, making the decision to you know to reopen and um to start doing takeaway so you might take us through kind of how that how that evolved the model that you're doing and, and how it all works yeah well uh thanks Ruth hello everyone hope you're having a good day um yeah it seems like a, a long long time ago now but um I guess prior to 
prior to March 17th, if we were to put Paddy's Day down as kind of the the milestone, um, it was the, the weekend really prior to that that we saw things changing, um, both in social media and uh, just in terms of the whole the whole feeling within the hotel, guest sentiment. And uh, we realized there was a problem imminent. So um, we, we started to consider closing the restaurants, um, but there was no way um, that I would ever consider closing down the operation entirely. Uh, I felt that, you know, to close down would mean we would be silent. Uh, there'd be no more 12 until, this, uh, until things changed. And uh, that just was not something I could consider. So, you know, we, we, I guess we, we dug deep in the sense of we had to decide, okay, we have to get everything down to rock bottom um, in the essence of everything closing. And from that point, once I could visualize it, it was creating something new. So over the course of uh, the three days coming up, one day prior, St. Patrick's Day, the day after, uh, that plan went into place. Um, you know, the, the weekend before that, I had 90 team members on, on our books. And uh, it was three days of speaking to everybody and telling them that things were going to change and that um, they were put on notice. So very, very tough. At the same time, you know, uh, the mind is torn between having to do that and having to be creative and say, OK, what's the new model going to be? Um, I'm very fortunate, got a very, very uh, strong creative team that I've worked with for many years. And um, we put our heads together and said, look, we can get through this. We had done similar things before, like our Christmas takeout dinner. When, that, when in essence the, the whole hotel is closed, but we still we look after 120 guests with takeout dinners on Christmas Eve. And we said, OK, that's that's our starting point and we need to build on that. Um, we had a successful takeout in Pizza de Zina for uh, people to walk into our pizza shop and uh, have a pizza to go. So we said, OK, well, that's we're doing that already. Um, so really it was getting another block, building on to what we had and saying, OK, let's do takeout. We had done a lot of volume before for uh, the likes of the, the Arts Festival in Galway. We would uh, do all the catering at the big top. So we were used to volume. Uh, we were used to kind of knowing what the guests would want, what sells, uh, how quickly we could produce it and how well it would travel. And uh, that was key. So we started off with a somewhat condensed menu. We offered our uh, takeout dinners to go. We were selling those three course box lunches um, with a pre-order system for Mother's Day, which was the weekend following. Um, the Friday night after St. Patrick's, essentially we had closed the restaurants. Uh, we just said that, look, firstly, the business isn't there. It wasn't safe for my staff. It wasn't safe for the guests. So we made the decision to close, but the takeout would have to work. Um, if the takeout would work, potentially at that point I was counting 10 jobs saved. To, to me, that was extremely important that I, I would protect uh, at least that number of jobs, um, all of which are my core management team. And uh, that I'd be able to support the community in the sense of being able to offer something to our guests in the region um, to support the frontline workers. So that was part of the business model that we'd have to give something back. So we uh, jumped on the Feed the Heroes straight away by launching free pizzas and frittatas for frontline workers, which is still heavily uptaken to today and it will continue while this goes on. And Fergus, um, I, sorry to interrupt you. Um, I was when we were speaking in advance, I was quite fascinated at the fact that you were first of all, you're you're doing this every every day of the week um, from from one o'clock in the day. And it's it's in terms of how you order and everything, it runs quite like a, a traditional takeaway in, in a sense. But of course, the process by which you collect it and everything is quite different. So can you take us through that customer experience, how it works, how people order, how they collect and, and how you managed all of that from a logistical point of view and the social distancing and everything? Yeah, I'll take you back to, I guess, what we learned. Um, so first night, the Friday night after St. Patrick's, um, that night effectively restaurants were still allowed to open. Um, we had closed our restaurants, but we had still uh, retained Pizza de Zina, the shop, 
as open. So as far as our regular guests were concerned, they were still coming into Pizza de Zena to order their pizza. We had launched a phone line and uh, it was through the phone line that people were now able to order their takeout menu. So on that night, we were dealing with people walking into the pizza shop and we were dealing with orders coming in the phone line. So essentially we had two separate kitchens. It was very hard to coordinate and it was extremely busy. We like we couldn't get over how much we had sold on takeout on our first night of first weekend of operation. So we said, OK, we have something here now. Now we have to correct ourselves. So after that night, we sat down in service and said, look, uh, we split the kitchens, which was wrong. We've always operated with two kitchens serving the restaurant uh, in a coordinated manner. So that's how we have to get to with our online uh, phone line ordering system. So we had already been doing it for many years. So we just turned things around and said there can only be one channel into ordering and that would be the phone at this point in time. So uh, we we had to get onto our tech suppliers. We had to cut off the voicemail. We had to make sure that there was only one number that people could ring on. If the phone rang out, it rang out. Our goal was to make sure to catch every call coming in. So Fergus, the, sorry, because we only have another yeah. minute or so. The, the, the customer's phone, they give their order and you you kind of, you, you give them an estimate of when they're, they're, the yeah. collection will be ready and then you, you're operating a drive through for collection. Let me, take, let me take you through it then. Uh, I'll try to take it as coherently as I can. It's, there's a lot of, a lot of strategy involved. Um, so essentially the, the way to the marketplace is through our phone line. We promoted that on Facebook, social media, uh, word of mouth got out. Um, one phone line to ring in. Yes, we said that we would open from one o'clock to ten o'clock every night. Uh, essentially, the goal was to have uh, ten full-time members on full-time hours uh, with their days off. So that was the dream and it worked. Uh, we said our hours of operation would be from one to ten. Um, guests would call in, we would give them a, a pickup number. So that's essentially, think of it as this is table 12, this is table 13. So the same way as a restaurant operates. So we would estimate a time. Uh, normally our pickup time would be 20 minutes. Um, in peak times, we'd be quoting an hour and a half. Um, the guests would arrive through the drive through It's all signposted. We basically took over the car park uh, because it's a round circle. We were able to create the drive through where a guest can come in one side and drive out the other side. We wanted it to be as safe as possible, both for our guests and for our staff, so we went completely contactless, and that's what we promoted right from the start, in the sense of that you can, you are safe, you will be giving an order number. When you arrive at our facility, you will ring us to say you're outside. We will place your order in your car, just open your boot door. So completely contactless, payment, everything was taken over the phone prior to the guest arriving, and it worked. Sorry, I'll, I'll jump in there. So yeah, that's thank you for that, yep. Fergus. That's, um, and I suppose it's great that you you guys have the space as well to for people to circulate. And I think that's a really interesting model for hotels or for anyone who has has that space. And I know there's a couple of places who have that model going of dropping to the the boot of people's cars. Yeah, um, but but even still, Ruth, um, I've I've received many calls over the last few weeks as to how we've done this and what advice can be given. And it, it's certainly possible for any restaurant to do curbside. If we had not got the space, we would have done curbside. There's no doubt about it. Um, you know, every restaurant needs to look at what it is that they have, choose one thing that they're really good at, don't know what it is that they're good at and what it is that people want. And even if it was just one burger that was going out, but it was the best burger in the region, there is a demand for that and, and you can do it. It's so yes, we're fortunate we have space, um, but had we not, we'd be offering a somewhat different model, but we would still be doing it. Brilliant. Thanks, William Fergus. So we're going to go um, over now and we'll be back to, to Fergus later. Um, we're going to go to Johnny Conlon in Pudding Row in, in, in Sligo and um, quite a, a rural location that you guys are in, Johnny, um, and a very different business to to the, the hotel that, that Fergus is running. So um, maybe if you can give us very briefly um, the background to who Pudding, Pudding Row are, or what, what Pudding Row is, and, and what you guys, have, the direction you guys decided to take. Yeah, well, Pudding Row is my wife, Dervla, and myself, and our team. 
and it's a we do like breakfast brunch lunch all kind of based around fresh baked bread and bagels and cakes and we make all our own um, breads and things in house um, so our menu is heavily based around that things like french toast and scrambled eggs on toast and all that sort of stuff and we're quite rural so we have a lot of summer trade um, and our kind of summer season traditionally starts off around St Patrick's Day we kind of celebrate St Patrick's Day as in we've survived another winter and we're you know we're ready to go again and um, we were gearing up this year we had ordered in extra everything we had started ramping up production of everything and then on, by the Sunday before St Patrick's Day it was obvious that it just wasn't really going to work so we decided to close and we thought we'd just close and wait it out. At, at that point, nobody knew how long this was going to go on. Was it going to be three weeks, two months? It was just kind of all up in the air. So we thought we'd just take a break. But um, the next day, Dervla decided that she wanted to do some baking. We had a lot of ingredients that we could use up and try and clear out some of that sort of stuff. So we decided we'd um, do one day of baking every week for local collections for breads and cakes and things. And I quickly threw together a website to handle all the orders and take payments and organize collection times and things like that. So we, we did that. We did the first day that that was very well received. And then we um, decided we'd try two days and then that quickly turned into three days. And um, it's just it's been popular. And we, we started then after about two weeks, we saw um, these boxes that on post were doing like a prepaid post box. So we got one of them and we gathered up all our stuff and saw what could we fit in this and what would survive in the post. And we created the, what we call a comfort kit. So there's bagels and cake, and jam, chutney, granola, loose tea, all these nice things in it. And we put them up on the website to see how that would go. Thought maybe we might sell five or 10 of them, um, but it's really taken off. And we've, we've been, we're sending out about 60 or 70 a week at this point. Um, that's so that's great, kept, that's busy, yeah. And as you said, like you're now selling, you're sending those all over the country and you've got a small cafe in rural Sligo. So before this, your market would have been the people who walked in the door of the cafe on any given day. But now you're actually selling your products all over. All the over, country. yeah. And, and, and a, lot of them are, a lot of people are sending them as gifts to friends who they might have come here last summer or sometimes some people come here every summer and um, they obviously can't meet their friends this year, so they're sending them as gifts to them or they're sending them to, to family members that are cocooning. Um, so the, the reach, it's a, we have a national reach now where we had a very kind of narrow catchment area, kind of Sligo, um, Mayo um, and tourists. Like we're on the Wild Atlantic Way, so we would get a lot of tourists passing through during the summer. Um, but yeah, we're sending them. I think we've covered each county by now. Wow. And um, what I was quite interested in um, when you were talking is like your premises is very small. You've had to adopt a system where for the local collections, you know, people can come and um, pick up and they're given specific time slots. And I'm just wondering how you found the job of communicating with your customers, trying to keep, you know, your, I suppose, be customer service oriented, but also be very definite about what the what the rules of engagement yeah. are. Well, it, it was it was definitely easier at the start because everybody was taking this very seriously and they were just kind of happy to be able to get anything um, of their usual kind of weekly shops. Um, so people would kind of stick to the times and it was all fairly easy. But as it's gone on, people have kind of become a bit more relaxed and, um, you know, you just kind of we just kind of have to really drill home the message to people that, you know, this problem hasn't gone away. We have to keep taking it seriously. And we have to follow these rules. We have to be strict because of the rules that we have to follow. You know, we're all fo just trying to follow it and get through it. Um, so and how have you how have you communicated that with your customers? Well, on the website, we have a kind of explainer of how it all works. And then um, the night before every collection day, I send out an email to people with their collection time and with very clear instructions on it of how it works. Um, but it's fairly simple. We have a, we have a door down on the street level that's closed. I have the orders all ready to go at the door. And when someone comes in, I get their name, put their order on a table right inside the door and they just grab it and they're gone. And that's it. It's, it's fairly foolproof. Brilliant. And what I, I know you said you're very much focused on your baked, your baked goods and all your kind of, I suppose, a lot of the homemade goodies that you do yourself. What have you found has been the most popular and people have been seeking? Bagel. Definitely the homemade bagels. Um, I think we've made thousands of them at this, at this stage since the lockdown. 
Um, yeah, we can't make enough bagels. If you never see another bagel again in well, your I life. Don't mind. I get the leftovers, <laughs> so it's okay. Good stuff. Okay, thanks a million. We'll we'll come back to to you in a while as well, Johnny. Um, and we're going to go and talk to Grania O'Keefe now, who's in sitting in in Bujo in 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 Dublin. Hi, Grania. Um, so again, a very a very different business and a very different model that you kind of rolled out since the crisis. And I was quite interested in. First of all, how quickly you guys kind of reacted and adapted to the situation and what you did first to kind of keep keep things going after you made the decision to kind of not not have people coming into the restaurant anymore. And then and then how you kind of moved that on um, to to do in the, the home burger kits. So maybe just kind of briefly take us through how you started out and where where you went with it. Um, so initially, as soon as uh, as soon as we closed, we set up a permanent WhatsApp call on the outside of the restaurant. So it was mounted to the window and then the guests would come up, they would order through WhatsApp. So they didn't have to touch the phone and then the, the other phone was facing the, the the staff members at the till who took the orders, took the payments by cards, by putting in the numbers. So there was zero contact whatsoever. Um, and that worked, it worked well but it wasn't something that we, we could keep doing um, and it wasn't something that we wanted to keep doing because we, we needed to figure out a plan long term. And so we decided to put our energy into developing the Bujo Meal Kit, which is actually something that originally when we were opening three years ago, we already had in mind um, that it would at some point be something that would be available uh, to buy in Bujo. So we just pushed that forward and spent couple of weeks developing it um, alongside the EHO because we obviously anything that you're you're giving outside of your premises needs to be you know could go through the regulations um, and we waited until we got the microbial test to see the shelf life and products and then also with the EHO to get their approval and then we started doing deliveries of the meal kits so at this point the restaurant was closed completely we weren't doing any takeaway no click and collect the only thing that we were that was available to guests was was the meal kit and that was delivered I was like at the start actually by myself um and it was only in Dublin 2 and Dublin 4 and because just we wanted to provide you know to the to the community and then we rolled that out to the rest of Dublin and then to areas just inside of Dublin and we got a delivery partner uh, next day delivery and you know obviously we had to take our time with that because you have to get refrigerated vans you need to look into all the the EHO restrictions and approvals that you need to do that as well and then we moved on again so we kept doing the meal kits but we reduced them to just one day a week and the reason being is that we wanted to focus completely on reopening Bujo but only for click and collect. So the only way that you can order from Bujo is online. And the reason for this is for the ease of the guest. So it's as safe as possible for them, for our staff, and just a better experience. It's obviously not ideal to not be able to have people in the restaurants, but we're aware that we probably won't be able to for a long time. So we built around this. Um, we're currently building a hatch. If you go on to the Bujo Instagram, you can see that we're, we're already working on doing a hatch that it's literally going to be click and collect only from initially Thursday to Sunday. And the only way that you can order food is online through our website. And then the only way that you can collect your food is by coming to Bujo at your allocated time. This is to reduce queues, it's to reduce any uncertainty with, with guests of how you order, or how you get your food. And it's also for, for the safety and the benefit of our team and the guests as well. Um, and so we've just completely got rid of any in in store purchases. Um, to do this, it's it's a lot of work. We're really fortunate to have an amazing team. The restaurant manager has already done up a 20 page document, um, which is guidelines for our staff for our suppliers and basically you know what happens from when we open the door in the day until when we close the door and to do that you need to go through every every thought and every every process so there's no point in going to to these lands of you know refurbing the restaurant and changing our model if you have a weak link 
So that's why we needed to cover, you know, from the guests, from the team, and then also from the supplier side. And the amount of work that has had to go into this is, is phenomenal. But everyone, you know, is, is, is really on board. And there was also doing the meal kits, uh, you know, we were doing a lot of them at one point when the restaurant was closed, like a lot. And that was the owners of the restaurant, me, the managers, and we were building boxes. Like we were literally putting together cardboard boxes, which, um, you know, it's, it's, it's just, it's not something that you ever thought you would be doing, but everyone was really positive about it. We all realized that we had the same goals and it was really important uh, to, to keep, you know, to keep ourselves going and to keep the staff in jobs. And that was that was the goal. Uh, the goal was to keep the team on, keep providing uh, a service to the community, and then also, you know, keep keeping our brand alive and to move forward as well and keep moving forward. In terms of keeping the brand alive, Bronya, I was quite interested in like, I mean, when you guys rolled out um the kits, they, you know, they looked really slick. They really were like, you know, the Bojo Bojo look. And um, I'm just wondering, you know, how how you guys went through the process of kind of keeping your your customer experience and your brand identity, and also, um, how, you know, looking at the packaging side and everything. Because I know you guys are part of the Sustainable Restaurant Association. You have your three star rating there, so I know sustainability is a huge part of of what you do as well. So I'm just wondering how. I suppose how you did it all so quickly as well. Um, we, we so we work with um, a brand design team who we we worked with since the beginning, and also we're, we're three star members of the Sustainable Restaurant Association, and I curated the policy for that pre opening. So uh, although Bujo has been open just under three years, I've actually been working for them for five years, and two years of that was was getting things like our sustainability policy done up, but getting our rating from the SRA, and the three star rating is actually the highest you can get. So we're really proud of it. We built the restaurant bed around it and our, our product is, is a reflection of that. And my one of my concerns with everything that's happened is in, in the past decade, there's been this huge movement towards not using single use uh, throwaway plastic items. And the industry and all industries have come so far in achieving, you know, they might be little goals, but they, they're, they're going to be part of something bigger. And then now, what we're seeing instead of people saying use reusable coffee cups use you know don't use single use packaging it's let's use single use packaging because it's safer and you can throw it away um we have to work with that so all our packaging is 100 compostable in the restaurant then moving on with the meal kits it's not but it's as compostable as we can make it so our box is compostable some of the items in the box are compostable and what I'm hoping comes out of this, if there's if there's any sort of positive for the industry, is that there's a more focus on manufacturers to create single use compostable items. So like this cup, for example, is actually made from cornstarch. So it's completely compostable. Um, and to, to have that more accessible because restaurants are gonna struggle and they're not gonna be able to afford to maybe invest in compostable packaging if they don't already. And we need, the, you know, for the earth's sake and for the environment to make it more accessible for restaurants and make it the norm. And um, just in terms of the brand, how we kept, you know, our brand, I suppose, present in the box. We did up, if you can see that, the leaflet we had inside was just kind of explaining in a note for me, you know, how to cook the burgers, the allergens, all the required legal information. And then on our packaging as well, it's just what's compostable, what's recyclable and how to manage that at home. Because once, I mean, even if you put compostable items in a box, when you send them to people's houses, they might not know what that means. They might not have a compost bin. So it was important for us as well. Um, and then just overall, you know, keeping the brand present was to give, I suppose, certainty in a, in a time of uncertainty to our guests and to just make them aware that anything that we do, be it very quickly and in uncertain times, we'll still do it the right way, um, which is exactly what we're trying to do now with the remodeling of the restaurant, removing all the furniture, click and collect only, um, and just not having groups of people lining up outside. 
Brilliant. Thank you so much, Grania. That's that's fantastic. Um, I can see we're getting lots of questions coming in. Um, some of the questions are are kind of directed at specific panelists. So if any of you do, um, any of the panelists, while you're not speaking, if you do want to look through the questions, you can actually answer by text. Um, uh, by replying there, and if there's a question directed at you that that you want to answer. Um, but I see there are a couple of questions that are directed at Kevin, so we'll try and cover cover those as we go over to Kevin Arundel in um, in the Chop House in Dublin. Hi, hi Kevin. Um, and yeah, you might just briefly take us through um, the the model that you rolled out. Um, don't forget to un, unmute your microphone um, so we can hear you. Um, and yeah, particularly, I suppose, in terms of like the menu offerings you decided to, to go for, um, and what what has worked well and then there's some some people who are interested in hearing um how you find kind of online versus versus uh telephone orders yeah. um, i'll come to the online a little bit after because i learned this quickly as i was going along i mean 72 hours into lockdown okay what are we going to do gotta feed the wife and kids look after the family all my staff so i sat in a dark room and said let's write a menu very simple now i'm going to tell people i'm open and i put it up on every social media platform, printed menus, put them all around, really bad stickers on the windows of the chop house. Then we finally upgraded to QR codes, which I thought was really cool. But most people don't know what QR codes are, so I learned that message. Then I was handling all the phone calls, taking the Visa card payments, picking the time for people to get pick up our collection, then running in, cook the dishes of the six or eight menu items at the start, put it in the bag and put it over the railing. So that's where It's Untouchable came from. So I was handing the railing bag over the railing till two weeks of this, nearly a mental breakdown, as you can imagine. I, I found a company who created me a beautiful software platform. So I don't talk to, I love your customers. I don't talk to any customer now. If someone happens to ring up the restaurant, I'll immediately say, I will send you the link to the Untouchable website. It's all there, it's like an Amazon platform you can click and paste. It will only let you pick a five minute slot difference. You book, it was very confusing at the start for customers. They book, they bring me in the middle of service. I want to book two steaks at six o'clock. I go, no, go back five minutes or forward 10 minutes. The machine will let you book your slot. Six is gone. And it was kind of frightening. And now we're six, seven, eight weeks in, people really understand that they're getting the five o'clock slot and they're getting whatever, and we've added more and more things. We've got smarter of what we've done. So I would be saying to anybody looking at doing the takeaway, if they can get a software company to write you your menu with the packaging for the customer, because it's so easy and then your compliance is good. I have one boy in the kitchen with me today and nobody else in the building. Mm. Then Thursday we roll out, I have one girl handing bags out. That's how low we've gone down to. And yeah, it, so it, well, few people have asked that question, Kevin, about how you've managed social distancing, in particular in, in the kitchen. Well, it's me and one guy called a, a lovely young man. He's in since two o'clock. He's in after three or four hours getting set up. We go at five tonight and uh, we don't really open live until Thursday, but we, our platform is open. We have some clients, some local co corporate companies who are using us. So the platform is open for everybody, but we don't advertise it till Thursday. And from Thursday, I have a girl who just literally her gloves on. She's at the railing. You get your time. She hands the bag over the railing. Completely gone. So your customers literally don't come into the building? No. No, not at all. We've had the door open a couple of times by accident and they've wandered in. We've had to go, oh, no, please, please, please go out. Because if the door might be open by an accident. We say, no, please don't come in. Please go back outside the railing. We'll put it in the boot of your car. I don't mind. You know, but uh, Definitely for anybody, the online, if they can do it, like Gwani was saying, and Perth, it's brilliant. No more phone calls. I was doing the phone calls, take the credit card receipt, um, payment, going in cooking, whereas the, the, the website, people can run a very seamless. And also, if I were not a fish on a Friday night, I can hide it on the menu. With one click of a button on the app, I can take it off. Mm -hmm. Like three weeks ago, burgers were gone at half six. I closed them. I said to my, my boy, what's the phone ring? In came the phone call. I can't find burgers on the website. Yeah, they're sold out, but the beef bourguignon is there. The crab linguine is there. There's just no burgers left. So I, the app is built, I can hide them. 
so you can control your food costing as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I bought in last weekend six lobsters. They were gone in one hour. It's five black sole. They were gone the next day. And once they're gone, I close the app. So there's a lot of little tricks like that I've had to learn on my own very quickly. It's a steep learning curve for sure. And are, um, are alcohol sales an important component to what you're doing as well? Or? Brutal. <laughs> it's, it's, it's too many off licenses selling alcohol, as we all know. Every shop sells alcohol. I mean, I, I put on some more premium ones two weeks ago because some of my customers asked me for more premium ones, obviously discounted from the restaurant price. They're selling now. Like Whispering Angel will sell because it's for sale in the big high end supermarket um, off licenses. I'm selling it for the same price as them. So it's a throwaway purchase for the person buying the crab linguine and a steak will push the button for a whispering angel. They won't push the button for a bottle of Pinot Grigio because they can buy that in the off license. So another learning curve on that one from me. Brilliant. OK, thank you so much, Kevin. Um, and again, we'll we'll come back to Kevin again during the, the, the Q&A. Um, and now we're going to speak with uh, Clement Pavi. Cle Clement's a head development chef with Musgrave Marketplace. Um, Clement, you deal with a huge range of customers, I suppose, across lots of lots of different businesses, and um, lots of your customers, obviously, over the past two months, have either tried to stay stay open or or, or reopen, and have had to look at kind of quite dramatically changing their their business models. What have you found are the the biggest challenges they've been Facing. Hi, good afternoon, Ruth. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, definitely. Like, I mean, I, I, I work with many type of restaurants from uh, from uh, the typical or traditional Asian or, or cheap shop to to uh, to cafes, bistros, and and even fine dining. So, really, uh, uh, an extensive array of customers. Uh, one of the biggest challenge was regarding the menu, but the the angle that was approached was. Uh, how to sustain a very, very large menu when they wanted to sustain the social distancing in the kitchen. So how did, could they actually, you know, could they, could, could they actually uh, work in a kitchen environment uh, with keeping the social distancing? So one of the big things that had to be done was to, to, to reduce the size of the menu, uh, to reduce the size of the menu. So like one person could actually do the mise en place for, 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 for the restaurant. So, you know, it was maybe from a 25 item menu to go down to a to, to 10 item menu, where, you know, with, with five starters and five main course. Uh, but also like, I mean, to to, to time segregate the, the kitchen mise en place. So to, to maybe allow one person to come in the morning and one person to come in the afternoon. So like this, there was no, no, no cross, no cross contamination or no, 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 no cross of, of people. So that was one of, of the big learning. It was really how to, 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 to reduce the menu and how to adapt to the menu and also maybe to introduce some products. So like, I mean, you know, to, to make everything from scratch, fantastic and we're all for it, but sometimes as well, you know, maybe there was a time to, a time to, 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 to introduce maybe a, a, a ready-made relish for some, for, for some instance. So it was about choosing the battles you were going to fight to actually to be able to, to reopen the restaurant or, or to change the menu. Yeah. Yeah, and another area that we spoke with Grani there about um, is packaging. Like, obviously, people who are in the kind of quote unquote traditional restaurant space might never have offered takeaway. So that's something that they'd be maybe for the first time they'd be having to 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 look at packaging and ordering packaging. Yeah, definitely. And as I said, like I mean, working with with, with takeaways or traditional takeaways, like I mean, we had what what Grani had described as a as a the one time plastic going in the bin, and and a lot of the restaurants. Who basically are serving restaurant quality or restaurant grade type of food wanted to to to, to premiumize or to do something different, not just to, to use a, a plastic container of some type. So we 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 developed a, a quite a quite a range of uh, of fully compostable and a range of uh, more crafty uh, kind of packaging, and uh, that was one of the work we've done a lot with uh, with our customers, who was actually to, to to engage with them directly. So we engage with them through through WhatsApp, through uh, through, through through any type of uh, of means to actually show the pictures, take the pictures of the packaging and show the, the packaging that was available to them so they could choose it and then order it from us. And actually, I see we've had quite a few questions coming in and quite a few questions voted for that have been asking about um, whether restaurants have found it viable to roll out these models and use um, platforms like Just Eat and Deliveroo and whether they feel that that's going to be feasible on an ongoing basis um, to, to, to pay the fees and, and all of that. Um, and I know that's something that 
you also have worked with people on that, you know, most of your customers who weren't in this space originally obviously didn't have an online sales platform in place. So this is something that they needed to, to get up and running. Yes, definitely. So, like I mean, there was those two aspects there, but the, the aspect of the of the social, um, the aspect of the uh, online and the the platform to 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 get your 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 food online and to get your your, your food to to, to your customers. Um, Musgrave is just after launching a, a, an app there called uh, Takeout, uh, and you'll find it on Takeout. It's um, it's it's uh, it's a website. It's a uh, it's a website for for the customers to actually uh, get. Uh, to, to get their, their menus directly on the website and get the, the customers to 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 order directly from 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 their website. So uh, that's something you like. I mean, I'm pretty sure you, you might be able to, to to put the link at the end of, of the conversation there, where people can actually go and have a look at the at the website. There is a very very simple video that explains everything uh, and much better than I would actually. Okay, so yeah, so take out by Mosgrave Marketplace and yeah. people can register their their interest there and it, it, it's basically a platform that customers businesses can use and um, that's ready to go basically to to put their menus online yes. and set up set, set up takeaway without without the costs um okay that's brilliant thank you so much Clement. so um we're gonna kind of move on to the the q a part of the the webinar and um as you said, there's lots of questions coming in and we'll only have time for a few of them, but um, a lot of them are similar and we'll kind of group group them a bit. Um, so I suppose, and it's one of the things that we definitely wanted to speak about, there's lots of questions around the profitability of this. Um, and I suppose I'll go back to, to, to Fergus um, first on this one. Um, I mean, street front establishments, restaurants and hotels have quite different overheads to maybe places, you know, smaller, smaller premises um, that would be set up to, you know, to intentionally to kind of do takeaway. Do these models stand up financially for establishments like yours? And we'll, get, we'll have to get you to unmute your, your microphone, Fergus. Um, and I suppose a couple of people have mentioned, you know, obviously there's the wage subsidies at the moment as well. So I'm just wondering how viable you feel these models would be without that and going forward. Yeah, yeah, time will tell. Um, before the wage subsidy kicked in, we already knew we had a viable model. Um, and you got to imagine as well, uh, this is a hotel that I'm paying rent on, not, not just a restaurant. So we have a uh, massive overheads that we can't get away from. And uh, in order for this to work, uh, we would have to have been able to cover those. So even before the wage subsidy kicked in, we were going in the right direction. We're seven weeks into it. We're still looking for patrons. Uh, it's hard. I mean, one week we may have done better than the week prior. Um, there isn't a patron yet, but we're, we're making it work. It is financially viable for us at the moment. When the hotel opens, that's my biggest concern because that's when um, there's going to be massive overheads that I cannot control as well as I can control now. When we reopen, um, we, we number one, <laughs> back to it again. We have to protect our staff. This has to be the safest environment for our staff to work in. And that confidence then is spread from the staff to our guests that are coming in. They have to see it as a very, very safe environment. But yet we have to juggle that um, the ambience that one is trying to create within a restaurant uh, in in now a very safe environment. So we have plans for that. We, we've we've worked a, a hell of a lot over the last few weeks looking at different models. Uh, a lot of information is coming from the States and restaurants over there and Italy and so forth. And, you know, there's some wonderful ideas out there. Uh, the templates are there and it's really adapting it to your business. So uh, I, I will never go down the route of um, delivering because I, I fight with my team to save 2% on food costs every month, 1%, 2%, so to, to actually consider giving away 5% and more to a delivery company now just makes no sense whatsoever. So that's certainly when it does not become financially viable. Uh, and I can't see how it could be for any restaurant. I struggle uh, with the maths as to um, restaurants now opening, doing takeouts, and handing over a percentage of that to a delivery company. It just doesn't make sense to me. 
And I would encourage restaurants um, not to go into price wars. I've seen many, many establishments take our menu, our copy from the website, and put it put it up as their operation. But and the only change they would make would drop the price by a euro on each dish. I mean, it's insane. So if that's the road that uh, the restaurant industry is going to go down over the next six months, uh, there'll be a lot of failures. You know, everyone needs to find what it is that they're good at themselves um, and, and work on that and not copy each other uh, and not compete on price. Uh, it's becoming evident already in the marketplace here in Galway. And, you know, if, if the restaurant industry is going to be a new industry, it needs to have a reset button now. And this is it where we are not struggling with the margins that we've always struggled with prior on a global level. Um, this is something where, you know, it should be a shake up for all of us within the industry, the whole world as to say, we're not going to accept these margins anymore. We're, we're going to be able to pay our staff better. Why should the people who work in this industry be some of the lowest paid in the industry worldwide? It's, it's just not right. So, you know, there's a lot of consideration to, to be made and it's only when everybody realizes this together uniformly, globally, not just in Ireland, that um, we'll see a change. But yeah, margins are still tight, and uh, it's always going to be about looking at the books every single day. We do that. I mean, but we started off with 10 people, um, 10 jobs protected. We're up to 15 now, so it's an achievement. Um, alcohol, Kevin, you were talking about, yeah, we, um, we, we sell a lot of wine. We sell... Uh, <laughs> A hell of a lot of cocktails. So we're, these are going all over the country. Our brown bag cocktails. Uh, they're gonna. This now will become uh, another element of the twelve from here on. They'll be in every guest mini bar when people come back to us. Um, the 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 uh, takeout model. It'll still continue. We've already decided how that will operate once the restaurant opens. But it's going to be our new revenue stream. There's no getting away from it. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Fergus. Yeah, and it's really interesting, I suppose, the different revenue streams now, as you said, in addition to your, your takeaway food menu, you've done your cocktail packs and even spa at home packs. So it's a real kind of taste of, of what the 12 does and yeah. that will continue as part. That's brilliant. Yeah. Kevin, um, a few a few people, um, again, I suppose, asking about the financial model. I don't know whether um, People asking what your what your GP is um, if you if without uh, without taking into account the cost of deliver uh, just eat delivery that kind of thing. But you haven't gone that route either. You've stayed away from delivery. I don't know if you want to I'm talk like, about. You, you couldn't justify 25, 30 percent to deliver So I might as well just stay at home. Um, now we've just gone straight up. We're a premium brand. We're a chop house. We're an expensive steakhouse in an old pub. I've always had fun doing that, cooking really, really good food. And what I bought 10 years ago was a shitty old pub. And people liked the brand. They came in, they're going, they're having scallops in the dump of a pub. And it shocked them so much. And we shocked them from day one. And now they'll stay with me if I will not drop. And the biggest thing I learned, and probably all of us are learning, is how to get my product in the box, looking to your house as good, similar to what I do. I have a customer coming tonight at seven o'clock for two black soul. And I texted him last week, I said, Dermot, love you, man. They're expensive again, I don't care. Mm -hmm. He had them last Friday and every Friday night, he has two black soul for himself and his wife. It's cheaper than sitting in the restaurant, it's, but it's still expensive, but I have to produce it absolutely perfect in boxing for him to sit down at home. And people will, people, people will stay with you if, you if you stick to your core values and not cut corners. And you go down to Deliveroo, and the one restauranter, oh God love him, he's doing Deliveroo, and he's giving like 30% of his not so big turnover because he 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 doesn't know how to change quickly, and like you might as well just be at home. Mm. There's no value. I mean, is, work. sorry for interrupting. So people are asking there as well: is is takeaway as busy now as it has been over the past few weeks, or have things slowed a little bit? Uh, we, very funny. We 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 started off in the nightmare scenario. We built, got a good platform. I've got a few nice corporate clients who like using me now for their teams, who security teams and all that. And uh, it went up and up and it dipped a little bit mid last week because loads of other places have opened up now doing for customers other options. 
but we worked really hard. Me on Friday, towards the Friday, on telling people we're still here, we're still doing it, and it's we've actually flatlined quite nicely now, you know, because people on, on my web system, I can see I have 72 percent repeat customers. So the analytics on the software program okay. will show me exactly who is coming back to me, those who want to follow me and be given. I can then next month send them out packages and loyalty programs or they can deny and not accept it. But all that stuff is possible as opposed to a phone call because you're talking to little Mary and she wants to talk to you for a while and you're there in the kitchen busy. You know, and you, you want to be cooking. So Brilliant. No platform Thanks, Kevin. John, Johnny, um, I'll come to you. There's someone asking specifically um, whether you intend to keep up doing the unpost boxes once you um, are able to reopen. Um, and also people asking about what online platform people are, use, uh, are using, but I think all the businesses here kind of developed their own. I know I know you did anyway. Yeah, well, I used a um, software called uh, WordPress and this, there's a plugin then for that called WooCommerce and it's mostly free, but then if you want to do some Kind of premium features you just buy little bits of software and add them into it so i've done a few of them um but there's there's loads of options out there there's loads of free options out there and um, there's loads i like i have a background in web development so i can do a lot of that stuff but there's loads that it's it's not much more complicated than than doing up a document in word really you know you're just copying and pasting text and links and things so in terms of your your future business mix, do you see yourself continuing with what you're doing at the moment and how, how do you plan to evolve things? And I suppose also to talk a bit about the, the profitability of these kind of models as well. Yeah, well, profitability, it's kind of hard to tell at the moment. Um, it's I think it definitely is profitable, but we've spent so much of the last few months paying off like other bills that like say it's taken us two months to pay off some suppliers which we would have normally paid off by the end of March because the, the level is so much lower but since we've gotten that cleared off it's it's definitely working like the, the expenses are less the profit the profits are less but there's still profit there and um, for the future we're kind of I think this is going to be our model for a while we're, we're looking to open up a, a kind of retail space where we can do more takeaway type of food like coffee and salads and things like that but we'll continue with the online sales and with the the postal orders we've had lots of interest on that we've had people saying they want to get them for august and september and i don't think people are going to be rushing back to to visit family or friends um or not a huge like wide group of people for quite a while so yeah i think that's i think it's our future Brilliant. Th thanks, Johnny. Um, and Gwania, um, there's a, a few people have been asking about um, whether whether people consulted with their their EHOs, um, and I know that's something that you you talked about specifically. So you might kind of take us through that, how that worked, because some people said our EHOs doing consultations over, over Zoom, um, and then people wondering who you worked with as a delivery partner outside Dublin. Um, and if I can throw in a third element for you, a lot of people asking um, about social distancing, you know, for staff and in the kitchen and whether you're using masks and things like that. So you might tell us what your experience is. Um, yeah, so on the EHO, we since we've opened, we've had an EHO consultant and um, so she doesn't work uh, for the EHO, but she she she's a half of consultant. Um, and we she helped us set up our like healthy system and the food monitoring system and then also give us our guidelines for the restaurant and um, like EHO is they're still very much active and if not more so now they can't physically come into restaurants yet I'm not sure maybe they can now but at the time what it was is that we went through our consultant and asked her to work directly with the the REHO um like our the officer specific to our area and find out what exactly what we would need to get her approval to do the meal kit boxes and we got all that done uh, so she didn't actually have to come into the restaurant I think someone was saying did you meet over zoom no um but we just had direct contact with our consultant who worked with the AHO for us and then we linked up with the M and we had all the, the information that she needed from us to get the go ahead um the, we use cube Cube Logistics for the delivery um, and we found we, like we, we looked into numerous different partners and 
we had to get the, the ones that we, we thought fit the best for our ethos and could, could kind of represent our brand the best when delivering the, the product to the customers. And then on the social distancing, the W the World Health Organization recommends uh, one meter distance between workers um, in the kitchen or in any space. But this is actually reduced if uh, all the workers in the restaurants are wearing PPE. So we have face masks, gloves and any other protective gear. That's the WHO guidelines. So that's not the mandatory. In Fujo, we created a policy about what our specific guidelines are. So by reducing the capacity in, in the restaurant and even in taking collect, we've reduced the, the staff members that we need as well. And also by doing only click and collect and not physically bringing the food out to guests, we've reduced the numbers of people that we need front of house. And so in the kitchen, uh, we've redesigned that I'm actually getting it at the moment. You can probably hear like drills and stuff in the background, but getting the kitchen refitted a bit, getting the front room refitted a bit. And it's the kitchen is specifically to redesign the flow of how service works. So keeping the standards of food, but obviously reducing the capacity and reducing the people required to do it. And our team members are wearing face masks and gloves at all times when they're in the restaurant, um, especially in the kitchen. Thanks, Emily and Grania. Um, so we're we're rapidly coming to, to the end of our time, believe it or not. Sorry, we can't get to any more um, questions. I hope we've kind of touched on most of the things that people have been asking about. Um, again, if any of the panelists want to directly reply to any of the queries there with a quick with a quick text reply that would be that would be super if you have if you get a minute um so to wrap up um i was just going to ask each of you and i'll start with fergus and go in the same order as as earlier um just i suppose if you've got one a really quick kind of in 30 seconds um important piece of advice or final kind of comment i suppose that you'd like to share with other businesses that are looking at going into this space what would that be Oh, sorry, Fergus, you'll have to unmute your mic. <laughs> now you've only got 10 seconds. No, I'm really joking. Go on. <laughs> uh, yeah, cool. No, I guess know your brand. Um, know what it is that you're good at. Don't 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 copy somebody else. Find out what it is you're good at, what you what you can actually do. Uh, and even if it's just a burger, one burger, but make it the best burger around, you know, that's it. Don't don't try to be all things to everyone. Um, yeah, and uh, don't all do burgers. One, <laughs> one important thing: um, we took a pledge at the start. Uh, I don't think we've touched on this here today, but we all took a pledge at the start that every one of us will social distance at home. A lot of us have families, a lot of us have kids, so that carried through to our kids as well. In order for this to work, we had to. Be sure that every day when we come to work, that one of us was not going to pass it on to somebody else. And that will have to, that's going to be the hardest thing to get through over the next few months when restaurants reopen. Uh, it has to be consideration. Yeah, thanks, Fergus. I'm glad that you brought that in because I did, we did mean to touch on that earlier. And I think that's huge. I mean, the communication with your team and the buy in from everyone that, mm -hmm. that everyone needs to do their the bit to keep everyone else safe is, is, is massive because otherwise the whole thing can fall apart. Yeah. Um, Johnny, I'll go on to, to you for a quick final final word on from you. Yeah, well, I, I suppose what, what we've really tried to focus on is to kind of have a really safe baseline of what we can do and not go too far beyond that too quickly and just wait and see what happens. Because there's so many unknowns out there, like this date of the 29th of June that's been talked about. That's not even definite yet whether that's going to happen. If it does happen, there's a chance the phases could roll back if the numbers go too high. So there, there's so many um, things out of control. So we've kind of just come up with this bulletproof business model that we, no matter what happens, we can always go back to this level and we're kind of take baby steps then to, to move on and add new features to that. But worst comes to worst, we can continue doing that and kind of, you know, keep the fridges on. That's our, that's our kind of aim. Brilliant, thanks. Grania? Um, I would say to, you know, the most important thing is to have a list. Uh, a list of the priorities and what is most important, you know, the safety of your guests and your staff being number one and build your plan around that and also build it for longevity because the 29th, like 
it's not all restaurants will be able to, to welcome people back in. And I know in Bujo that the plan we're doing at the moment is, you know, keeping in mind that we probably won't have people sitting in the restaurant for quite some time. You need to build your plan around that thought instead of, you know, hoping that you're just going to have a full restaurant again soon. Also being able to adapt. I mean, we're, we're blessed as an industry that we are incredibly adaptable, creative and two really incredible examples of this are one is Leah. Leah restaurant uh, had chef Damien Gray in Dublin. I got their meal kit last week and it was like eating a mission star meal in my home. And they are a one star restaurant and they're doing these to go kits and they've done it really well. Kind of created it as a separate entity to the restaurant. So they, they still have Leah and then Leah to go. And then the other really extreme version of this is Noma restaurant, which is on numerous occasions been, been named the best restaurant in the world. Two mission stars, Rene Redzepi is now selling burgers in Noma, which is mental. But it's like one, one burger and then one vegan burger. And they've completely, you know, they've they've thrown out the Michelin Guide for the moment just to get through it. They've completely adapted and it's, you know, obviously with their team in mind so that when they do reopen and when it's safe to reopen, they can do what they did before again. So just being creative, adaptive and then also, you know, just surrounding yourself with positive people, positive team members who, you know, create, you know, more solutions than they do problems. Would, be, would definitely be the key. Brilliant, Grania. Thank you so much. And absolutely, I think adaptability and flexibility are really key, key words. And thankfully, this is an industry that's really agile and you know really quick to to adapt and to find solutions. I think that's the key thing. Really, really solutions focused people. Kevin, have you got something sage to share with us? Oh, it's unlike me to have something to say. Um, just to finish off, very very short. People follow a brand in any industry from cars to whatever. I've had to, like all of us, had to restart seven and a half weeks ago and restart myself, which in some way is not a bad thing. And now when my team, please God, start coming back from the start of June, we'll be ready to rebuild with the untouchables going to stay, the click and collect's going to stay, and the kitchen team will have to get used to that as part of their kitchen order. But we will build a system around where premium times, you won't be able to get the click and collect. It'll be the restaurant sit down, hopefully, with maybe 50 seats left in the building from 140. And that's what we have to do. But I found that it's actually been testing me more and I have done for a long time in this horrible, horrible time. And hopefully we all have a little giggle at the other side, you know, and this, <laughs> you know, because it's, it's not been fun for anybody. And yeah. the social distancing is the biggest one. And we've got signs up since yesterday. And one door can be one door's gonna be coming in, one door's gonna be going out. The upstairs have become more restaurant than function room because that's just the way, there's no more function room for I'd say the next year. I won't have a function up there, so it'll be a staircase. I'm lucky I have two staircases. One staircase will be up, one staircase will be down. Allocated times. So there's a lot of legwork, but we can do it. The drawing is him. We're adaptable. We've no choice. <laughs> Thanks, Kevin. Tamon, I'll let you have the, the last word on, I suppose, advice or comment for, for people. I, I, I think the situation has brought everybody and we, we can see all the challenges, but I think, and we've heard that for the past hour, it brought, it's bringing a lot of opportunities as well. And, you know, it's the creativity and the adaptability of the uh, of the profession of uh, of uh, of the food service industry is just massive. And, you know, it's, it's um, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty fantastic to see what's happening as well. Brilliant. Thank you, Clement. So that's a great positive note for us to, to end on. We're gone slightly over time, so apologies for that. Um, there's thank you for the huge interest. We had 259 people join us live for, for the full webinar. So thank you to everyone who joined us. But a huge, huge thank you to our panelists for taking the time out and especially for being willing to share their experience with others. Um, hopefully we'll be able to bring you more webinars like this in the future. So do send your feedback and let us know what you're interested in, in hearing about. Uh, we will send out the link to everyone who was registered with the recording. We'll um, and we'll include um, any relevant follow up links that 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 link again for the platform that Musgrave Marketplace are making available uh, to businesses is takeout by Musgrave Marketplace.ie. But we will include that um, in the email. 
if you're a chef and you're not signed up to Chef Network yet, you can sign up at chefnetwork.ie to be part of the Chef Network community. It's free. And if you're not a chef, you can also go to chefnetwork.ie and join our mailing list so you find out about any other events like this that we're doing. Um, and that's it. Thank you so much for joining us today and bye for now. Thank you.